Let's open up to, first of all, uh, James chapter 1. Now, last week in our time together, we saw that God has an amazing and a very significant plan of the ages. That, that he's not making up as he goes along. No, this was a plan of the ages that began in eternity past. And God has been calculating. God has been planning. God, as if you want to use the picture, he's been writing out things on a great blackboard of the universe and trying to, to bring it to an ultimate accomplishment that he's already told us what the final answer is. And that is to resolve all things in Jesus Christ. And I know about you, but at the end of last week, I, I mean, I was kind of pumped up by all of that. I was like, yes, Lord, you're so good. You've got such a wise plan. What a glorious God you are. A very logical question to ask. Well, then what went wrong with all of this? I mean, you, you could almost say God has a very pretty plan, right? But it's not a pretty world we live in. And it's not a pretty experience that many of us have had in our life in the past, in the present, and for some of us in the future. We take a look at the world around us and things don't look so good and we wonder why a God of such love and such power with such a great plan could allow all of things to get in the way they are in the world today. A lot of people wrestle with this question. You could almost say that everybody wrestles with it. Some years ago, there was a well-known Jewish rabbi named Rabbi Harold Kushner. And he wrote a remarkably wide-selling book with this title, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Do you remember that book? Oh, what was it, 20 years ago, something like that? Very, very big seller. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for a whole year. And w w without going into all the particulars of the book, I I'll boil it all down to him. The whole point of this book was to say this, that God is all-loving, but Rabbi Harold Kushner said God is not all-powerful. It's just beyond his control. you got to cut the guy some slack. He can't do everything. And that was basically his solution to the problem of evil. So when bad things happen to good people, it's because of events that are out of God's control. That was his answer to the question. Kushner advised his readers to do this, and I'm quoting here, quote, Learn to love God and forgive him despite his limitations. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's not the God of the Bible. That might be the God that Harold Kushner had in his imagination, but that's not the God of the Bible. Listen to what the Bible says about God. You ready for this? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to His purpose. Does that sound like a God who doesn't have all things under His control? He has it. He knows what He's doing. Then, then how does it work? How do we see God working all things together from the very beginning. Well, this deals with a very important issue that we have to deal with tonight. If we're going to talk about this question, what went wrong, we have to talk about the question of where evil began. And let me tell you where evil began by first telling you where it did not begin. God did not create evil. I'll say it again. God did not create evil. That's why I taught you to ask you to turn to James chapter 1, verse 17, where it says this. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, James is telling us that in God, there is not only no darkness, there's not even the shadow of darkness. Instead, what comes down from God is every good and every perfect gift comes down from God. And if you want another idea along these same lines, look at James chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. 
Now, I could put up here and put before you passage after passage from there, where God says that He is holy, that God says that He is righteous, that, that He is sinless, and there is no darkness in Him whatsoever. On and on and on. God is a perfect being, and in Him there is no sin, and God can never be responsible for the creation of sin. Nevertheless, we know that evil had a starting place. The Bible tells us where evil started. Evil started among the angelic beings. Now we know that God created the angelic beings before he created the heavens and the earth. We found that out last week because we saw that the angelic beings rejoiced for joy at God's creation of the universe. So they must have been created before. And we don't know exactly when it happened in the timeline. Maybe it happened that there was this angelic rebellion before God created the heavens and the earth. Maybe it happened right when God created the heavens. We don't know exactly. But sometime before the creation of man, there was an angelic rebellion. One angel. You could call him what the Bible calls him. In the book of Isaiah, Lucifer, perhaps the angelic being highest in authority, he rebelled against God, and he asserted his authority against God. And that's the first passage we're going to look at in some depth here this evening. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14. Now, I wish we had an entire evening to talk about Isaiah 14, because it would be profitable. Isaiah 14 is important to understand in its broad context. Because it's one of those interesting passages in Scripture where two are in mind at the same time. Isaiah is speaking prophetically to the king of Babylon, but he's also speaking beyond the king of Babylon to the spiritual being that is Lucifer himself who animates and inspires and guides the king of Babylon. And that's why he says, starting here at verse 12, we're going to take a look at Isaiah chapter 14, starting at verse 12. He says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations! For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths, depths of the pit. Here, the prophet Isaiah identifies, and again, we'd have to go back further in Isaiah chapter 14 to pick up the full context on this, but he identifies Lucifer with this king of Babylon. Now some people debate whether or not that title or name, Lucifer, is a name or a title. Lucifer means morning star or day star, referring to a brightly shining object in the heavens. Whether it's a title or whether it's a name really makes little difference though, because this once brightly shining king who was associated with Babylon in Isaiah's day is now fallen from heaven. And again we see this prophetic habit of speaking both to a near fulfillment and to a distant fulfillment. There was a far, far more brightly shining star than the king of Babylon in Isaiah's day, and that was Lucifer, son of the morning, the king of spiritual Babylon, Satan himself. I think it's fascinating, verse 12, that it tells us that he was fallen from heaven. In fact, if you go through the scriptures, you're going to find something very interesting. You're going to find that there are four falls of Satan. Not just one, there's four. And I believe that this one in Isaiah refers to his fourth fall, his final fall. Do you want to know about the four falls of Satan? Here's the first one. Satan fell from glorified to profane. You'll find that in Ezekiel chapter 28, another passage that I wish we had the time to go into this evening. But this is what Jesus probably was speaking of in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, when he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This is the only fall of Satan that has already happened, from glorious to profane. Secondly, the second fall of Satan, 
is Satan will fall from having access to heaven, which he has right now. Did you know that Satan has access to heaven right now? That might freak you out. That might spook you a little bit. Is it true? Matter of fact, you know this from the book of Job. You know this from the book of Revelation, where the Bible tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he accuses God's people before the throne of God day and night. Doesn't that kind of creep you out? Satan is accusing us before the throne of God. And I don't know if you know what it's like to be accused. It's nasty. And to be accused by a liar, that's even worse. Aren't you happy that you have the best defender in heaven that the world has ever seen? Jesus Christ is our defender. Satan's the accuser, but Jesus is our defender. But there's going to come a day where that's done. Where no longer will Satan have access to heaven and God will restrict his activities to the earth. That's documented in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Then, the third fall of Satan, Satan will fall from his place on the earth to bondage in the bottomless pit, and that will happen for a thousand years. That's described for us in Revelation chapter 20. And then the fourth fall of Satan, the fourth fall of Satan, the one probably referred to right here in Isaiah 14, is where Satan will fall from the bottomless pit to the lake of fire, which we commonly know as hell. That will happen in Revelation chapter 20. So Satan falls, 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 and falls again. But when Isaiah speaks him right here in chapter 14, he hasn't quite fallen yet, yet, or he describes as he is before his fall, he's glorious, he's the son of the morning. That is a title of glory and beauty and honor which perfectly fit Lucifer before his fall. You know how glorious a morning is? I mean, once you blow the June gloom out away, right? And the morning is just so glorious, isn't it? It's just beautiful. Son of the morning. You see, in the Hebrew manner of thinking, to say something is the son of something means that it's characterized by that thing. If you're the son of lies, you're characterized by lies. If you're the son of truth, you're characterized by truth. If you're the son of the morning, you're characterized by the glorious, bright, shining morning. Before his fall, Lucifer was characterized by by the glory of the morning. You know, Jesus himself is called the bright and morning star, is he not? And, and though Satan is a created being, he had some of these glorious qualities in himself. No wonder that today Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And he deceives many people with his apparent glory, beauty, and goodness. But it's not true beauty, glory, and goodness. Because what happened? Look at verse 12. How you are cut down to the ground. What a contrast. This being once so high, once so shining, once so bright, is now cut down to the ground. And why? What happened? Verse 13 tells you why. Look at it carefully. It says, For you have said in your heart, God here tells us the reason behind the fall of this king of Babylon, Lucifer himself. The fall was prompted by something he said, even though he may have never said it with his lips. It was enough that he said it in his heart. By the way, you have to watch what you say in your heart, do you not? You have to watch that. You have to say, Lord, I, I want to think the thoughts of my heart after your thoughts, after your word. But Satan said something in his heart. And what did he say? You saw it right there starting in verse 13 and going into verse 14. It caught your eye, didn't it? I will, I will, I will, I will. The pride, the grasping self-ambition, the self-will of the king of Babylon is powerfully expressed in these five I will statements. My friends, this is the essence of of the self-focus and the self-obsessed life. This was the assertion of Satan's will in opposition of the will of God in heaven. Now, you know, I might ask a question. Why did God give this angelic being called Satan the opportunity to express his will in opposition? Well, why didn't he just make him like a robot, like, like an automated being? who had no will that he could express. I'll tell you one of the reasons why. 
is because what the Bible tells us from heaven is that the angels, even the most glorious angels, perhaps I should say especially the most glorious angels, they worship God in heaven. And if worship is not given out of a heart that is freely chosen, it, it's worthless. God doesn't want worthless worship. God wants beings to love Him and adore Him out of a freely chosen, freely given impulse that says, I choose to love you, God. I choose to worship you. And that's exactly the kind of worship that God wanted from the angelic beings, and should I say it too, from the human beings as well, right? And so He gave the angelic beings the capability, the opportunity to choose to assert their will either for God or against God. And at this point in God's unfolding plan, this being that we called Satan decided to assert his will against God. And he said it five times according to Isaiah, I will, I will, I will, I will. Over and over again. Notice what he first said. It's in verse 13. I will ascend into heaven. Heaven will be my home and my place of honor, Lord God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be enthroned and exalted above all other angelic beings. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I will sit in the place of glory and honor and attention. And then into verse 14, I will ascend above the heights. He said, I will continue to rise even in heaven until all see me in my bright, shining glory. And then finally, and perhaps most blasphemously, number 5 and verse 14, he said, I will be like the Most High. I will be glorious, and I will be set equal to God far above all other created beings. I find something very fascinating as you take a look at those five I will statements. You see the desire to exalt one's self, but not so much the desire to exalt oneself above God. For example, take a look at the last statement there in verse 14, the last I will. What does he say? I will be like the Most High. In other words, you might presume from this that Satan's instinct was not to say, well, I'm going to be greater than God, but rather, I will be equal to God and above all other angelic beings. It seems that Satan's desire was not so much to be above God, but to be honored and regarded as the highest angel above the other stars of God, receiving the glory and intention one would receive, being next to God, equal to God, like the Most High. This teaches me something very powerful. It teaches me that we don't have to be, we don't have to have the desire to be exalted higher than God to be like Satan. It is enough to want to be exalted above other peoples. It's a dangerous thing. Now, Lucifer was certainly a glorious angel. He was a day star. He was the son of the morning. He was also called, in Ezekiel chapter 28, the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty, and the anointed cherub who covers. Yet there came a time when despite all of his beauty and all of his glory, he departed from the heart of God by wanting to exalt himself above his peers. And in complete contrast to that, the heart of Jesus says, the status of equality that I have with God is not something to hang on to. I will let it go, and I will give up my reputation. I will be a servant. I will live humbly among men, and I will even die an excruciating and humiliating death. Do you know the passage I just paraphrased for you? Philippians chapter 2, right? Verses 5 through 8. And when Lucifer departed from this heart, he fell from glory. It's a very strange thing, is it not? Now we could ask the question, what prompted Satan's desire to exalt himself above the other creatures? What prompted these five I will statements? I mean, after all, why? What, what was it that Satan was protesting, that Satan wanted to be different about? 
Well, I'm going to suggest to you some answers that I can't say these with certainty because I personally don't believe that the scriptures are clear enough for me to talk about this with certainty. So I want to make it clear to you tonight, I'm being somewhat speculative here. But I have to say, it sure makes a lot of sense to me. And maybe it'll make sense to you, but I just want to be cautious about this. I want to make sure that when I'm going out and being a little bit speculative scripturally, you know that. And you can put that into perspective. First of all, I would say this. This is what prompted Satan's rebellion. Number one, man is made in the image of God. We know that from Genesis chapter 1. We also know that man is the only being, as far as we know, that's made in the image of God. Angels are not. Do you know what this means? It means that Satan and his angels hate man because they hate God, and the image of God is within you. I'll put it to you this way. Look, nothing personal that Satan hates you. It's just that you bear the image of God. And he hates that. Number two, this really comes to an interesting observation that human beings can have a relationship with God that angelic beings cannot. We are made in the image of God. We have a connection with God that Satan or other angelic beings, even faithful angelic beings, do not have. Do you remember last week when he talked about how the angels observe us and that there are things that they earnestly like to look into? Listen, I think it blows the mind of angelic beings the relationship with God that we have because we have a common ground with God that they do not enjoy. We are made in his image and they are not. By the way, here's a, just a little side issue on that. If I could take just a moment for this. Sometimes people like to ask the question, does God love Satan? Right? Now, aren't we told to love our enemies? And isn't Satan God's enemy? So shouldn't God love Satan? So shouldn't we love Satan? And people start talking like that, and sometimes we get so confused, I don't know what to think even more. I hate to say it, I'm supposed to love Satan and forget him. How do I even handle this? And the answer to the question, as far as I'm concerned, does God love Satan? And the answer is no. And this is why. Because God doesn't have the same kind of relationship with the angelic beings that he has with human beings. Love, in the sense that we describe it among human beings and the divine being, it's not the same thing between the divine being and angelic beings. You're talking about something else different completely. So no, God does not love the angelic beings the way that he loves human beings because they don't have the same common ground that we enjoy from this. And this tells us something else, the point being that deity and humanity are compatible. Let me put it this way. There came a time when the second person of the Trinity decided to add humanity to his deity. That's when Jesus became a man, right? He added humanity to his deity. He could only add humanity to his deity because humanity and deity are essentially compatible because man is made in the image of God. But this tells us something else. If Satan sees the image of God in you, and he hates the image of God in you, what will he try to do in his strategy against you? He will try to deface and debase the image of God in you. Listen, how many people does sin and Satan and temptation lead them up into a more glorious, bright and shining life? No, what does it do? It drags them down. It degrades them. It debases them. You know why? Because Satan wants to drag the image of God that is in within you through the mud. Now, I don't think he can destroy it. But he can deface it like a vandal can deface a beautiful statue. And that's why the sin and the temptation and the things that Satan typically draws men and women towards are things that debase the human character, not uplift it. Second point. Though mankind is beneath the angels in dignity, and we know that from passages like Hebrews chapter 2 and 2 Peter chapter 2, even though that's true, it is the job of angels to serve mankind. Now, on a relative scale, which is more glorious, angelic being or human being? Angelic being is. It, it's more glorious. Now, these more glorious beings are given the command by God that they must serve these less glorious beings. I don't think Satan liked that. 
I don't think a third of the angels in heaven like that. Can you imagine how that plan would have gone by? Satan says to the, excuse me, God says to the angelic beings, guys, here's the plan. I'm going to create these beings that are made in my image. They're, they're, they're going to be spiritual beings, but they're going to have bodies like animals. They're going to be these weird spiritual amphibians where they're going to have bodies like animals, so to speak, but they're going to have real spirits, and they're going to be made in my image. And these beings, these creatures, will be lower than you angels, but my plan is for you to serve them. And not only that, the next point of it being, some of mankind will be lifted in honor and status above the angels. Now listen, to me it makes perfect sense that Lucifer wouldn't like that too much and that he would despise mankind, and that he and his angels would refuse to serve mankind, and that they would want mankind to serve them. Don't you think it's curious that this is the great strategy of Satan? He wants mankind to serve him, where God had ordained that the angelic beings should serve human beings. But yet, because some mankind will be lifted in honor and status above all angelic beings, because you know this is your destiny, if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you are destined for heaven, you will sit in status above angelic beings. God even says that you will judge angels. Now, isn't that interesting? You, you a being who is now lower than the angels, when you are glorified, you will be lifted in glory and honor and status above them. And I think that in itself also rubbed the devil and his angels the wrong way. Satan and his angels want to prevent as many human beings from being glorified as possible. Because they do not like the idea that there will be human beings lifted up in glory beyond them. So you kind of get the picture here? God had his purpose and his plan. Satan had his purpose and his plan. But this is where we should stop and think just for a minute. We often get messed up here. Think of it this way. What's the opposite of light? What's the opposite of right? What's the opposite of good? What's the opposite of God? No! <laughs> Satan is not God's opposite, right? He never has been and he never will be. If you want an opposite for Satan, Look to another angelic being, perhaps a high-ranking angelic being like Michael. But God is God. God is divine being. Satan is angelic being. God has no opposite. So while we see that God has a purpose and a plan, and we see that Satan has a purpose and a plan, while they oppose each other, they are not opposites. In fact, and this just might blow your mind right here, in fact, Satan's plan is actually serving God's plan. At the end of it all, when God's eternal purpose is accomplished and his eternal plan is complete, it will be seen that Satan actually served God's purposes. He didn't frustrate it. Now, I could give you one small example of this, shall I? It's perhaps the greatest example, but, but it's, it's, it's easily and quickly explained. Look at what Satan did to the Son of God at the cross. Was it not Satan that stirred up Pilate and the crowd and the Roman soldiers and the religious leaders and all of that multitude? Was it not Satan that filled Judas with hatred in his heart to betray Jesus? Was it not Satan behind the scenes orchestrating all of that, compelling Jesus to the cross? Was there not, if I could use just sort of a, it's not accurate, but you'll know what I mean, was there not a party in the council of hells when, when Jesus Christ hung on the cross? They thought, oh, this is what we've been waiting for all our life, to kill the Son of God. We've done it. We pushed Judas, we pushed Pilate, we pushed the Romans, we pushed the religious leaders, we did it all. And there he is up on the cross. And right then, what was the greatest instrument of his own defeat that ever happened? It was the cross. 
Because it was at the cross that he disarmed principalities and powers. It was at the cross that he won his greatest victory. And right there, when Satan was doing the very best that he could to try to defeat God's plan, God was, in an infinitely wise way, rolling it all over into the advancement of his own plan. And this is how God works. Now listen, in the small pictures, this can be impossible or very difficult to see. You look at any one individual tragedy and you say, God, how does this make sense? How does this work? Uh, this looks like Satan is doing his thing. It looks like evil. It looks like sickness. It looks like pain. It looks like misery. And I completely agree with you. In one isolated incident with one person or one situation or one circumstance, we look and we say, it makes no sense whatsoever. But ladies and gentlemen, that's why God says, all things work together for good. Look, he never said all things work in isolation for good, right? All things work together for good. And at the end, it will be shown to serve God's glorious, divine purpose. Now, one other thing I have to add. Well, let's look here at verse 15 here. At, at Isaiah chapter 14, it says, Yet you shall be brought down. Satan's day will not last forever, no, never. Desi despite Satan's desire to exalt himself, he will not be exalted at all. I know that there is a sense in which in the world today Satan is exalted. But, but this is an eye blink in the scope of eternity. Satan, like all those who desire to exalt themselves, shall be brought down. That's the promise of God in Isaiah chapter 14. Now, one other point I should make before we continue on. As it happened, one-third of the angelic beings joined him in his rebellion. We know that from Revelation chapter 12. One-third of the angelic beings cast their lot with Lucifer, Satan, or whatever you want to call him, and they decided to be followers of him. That's why Revelation can describe him as the devil and his angels. Because these are angelic beings that decided they would rather be loyal to Lucifer than loyal to the Lord God. Now sometimes people ask the question, well listen, if angels have the opportunity to choose, do they still have the opportunity to choose? We can't say for certain, but the best implication from Scripture would say no. That whatever time for choosing that angels had, that time for choosing is over. And the good angels will be good angels, and the bad angels will be bad angels. Does that shock you or surprise you? It shouldn't, because the same happens for every human being. There's a time for choosing in the life of a human being. It's while we walk this earth. But there will come a day when the time for choosing for human beings is over, and your eternity is set. Apparently, that time has come and gone for the angelic beings. Now, the fall of mankind in Genesis chapter 3 is actually a tremendous preview of how God uses Satan to serve his larger purpose and how the doom of Satan was already determined. It shows us that when the fall happened, God did not cause it, but he was ready to respond to it according to his plan. You see, when we look at the fall, we see three things. You remember this back in the Garden of Eden? Genesis chapter 3. Why don't you turn there right now? Genesis chapter 3. When we look at the fall, we see three things happening. First, we see Satan deceiving Eve. Then you have Adam deliberately rebelling. And then finally, you have the pronouncement of judgment and curses by God. By the way, I... I boy, there's so many points I touch on tonight that I wish I had more time to talk about. One of them is this whole dynamic of Eve being deceived, but Adam deliberately rebelling. Doesn't it look like from the chronology in Genesis chapter 3 that Eve sinned first, right? Eve was the one who sinned first. Come on, ladies. Own up to it. <laughs> Eve sinned first. But don't you find it fascinating that the Bible nowhere blames Eve for the fall of mankind? Instead, amen, I heard a woman say right there. <laughs> Instead, the Bible says very plainly that Adam was responsible for the fall. Why? What was the difference between Eve's sin and Adam's sin? It's simply this. Eve was deceived. She was tricked. 
What she did was wrong, but she was deceived and tricked. Adam, he knew exactly what he was doing. And therefore, he was the one held responsible for the fall of the human race, which, by the way, has huge implications. Has huge implications for marriage, has huge implications for church leadership. These are all themes carried over in the New Testament that I don't have time to talk about right now. But <laughs> you see Satan deceiving Eve. You have Adam deliberately rebelling, and then you have the pronouncement by God. And first, God, in his pronouncement, he speaks to Adam and Eve, does he not? He speaks to them as individuals. Of course, they try to shift the blame, right? First, he speaks to them. Excuse me, no, excuse me. First, he speaks to the serpent. I got before myself there. In the very beginning, he's speaking to the serpent. He's addressing the cause of the fall at its root. Look at it here in verses 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, I need to just lay my cards out on the table right here. I believe that Adam and Eve were historical beings. I believe that there was actual an Adam, and there was actually an Eve, and that they were historical beings who were responsible for the fall of the human race, and that they are the father and the mother of the human race. Why do I believe this? Because not only does Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 teach us this, but Jesus taught this so. Jesus spoke of Adam and Eve as historical persons responsible for the fall of the human race and being the father and mother of mankind. But in addressing the sin, sin didn't originate with Eve. It didn't originate with Adam. No, its origination was with that serpent, right? With Satan himself. God didn't ask the serpent any questions. There was nothing to teach the serpent. And the curse upon the serpent had two parts. The first part of the curse was directed towards the animal that Satan used to bring the temptation. And that animal was the serpent. The serpent was cursed as an animal because the serpent was used as a vehicle of Satan. And God commanded that the serpent would slither on the ground instead of walking on legs as any other animal. Can I just offer a suggestion to you? You and I have no idea what a serpent looked like before the fall, before this curse. We have no idea. It might have been a very glorious kind of creature. We know what serpents look like after the fall. They're scary. They're spooky. But we don't know what they looked like before the fall. And I just have this picture in my mind as God pronounces this curse, whatever glorious form that the serpent was in before the fall, right before the eyes of Adam and Eve, it was morphed, it was transformed into a slithering serpent that wanted to get away off into the fields. That must have been mind-blowing for Adam and Eve to watch that. To see that once beautiful creature called a serpent transformed into the creeping, slithering, hissing snake that we know today. Adam and Eve must have been terrified. They must have thought, it's our turn next. What is he going to change us into? <laughs> now, in dealing with Satan himself, God put a natural animosity between Satan and mankind. Enmity has the idea of ill will, hatred, and a mutual antagonism. Satan's hatred of Eve was nothing new. It was already present. But now God said, I'm going to give mankind a fear of Satan. And mankind has this, does they not? Instinctively, men and women shy away from satanic things. Now, the very sad truth is that they can overcome that reluctance, right? Right? And there are many people who are too friendly or familiar with satanic things and occultic things, but they've had to overcome that reluctance because by nature we have a natural reluctance to these satanic things. We, we are born naturally rebellious against God, but we're also born cautious and afraid of Satan. Somebody has to be hardened to willingly and knowingly serve Satan. You know, by instinct, we don't serve God 
By instinct, we don't serve Satan. By instinct, who do we serve? Ourselves. Which, by the way, is just fine with Satan, isn't it? Now, God made this dramatic statement to Satan right here in Genesis chapter 3, starting right here in verse 15, where he says, And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. With this, God prophesied the doom of Satan, showing that the real battle would be between Satan and the seed of the woman. And by the way, if we couldn't figure it out just from reading Genesis, the New Testament makes it very clear that that seed of the woman is a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ himself. Isn't that wonderful? As soon as Satan got started, as soon as he won his first victory, God said, you're finished. You're over. The Son of God, the seed of the woman, he is going to come and crush your head. There's no doubt that this is a prophecy of Jesus' ultimate defeat of Satan. God announced that Satan would wound the Messiah, he would bruise his heel, but the Messiah would crush Satan with a mortal wound to the head. He shall bruise your head. And by the way, this prophecy also gives the first hint of the virgin birth because it declares that the Messiah, the Deliverer, would be the seed of the woman, but not of the man. That's why Genesis 3.15 has been called the Proto-Evangelicum, which means the first gospel. Martin Luther said of this verse, This text embraces and comprehends within itself everything noble and glorious that is to be found anywhere in the scriptures. And that's why God can say to Satan that you're going to eat dust. The idea behind that phrase in the Hebrew thinking is that of total defeat. God's judgment for Satan is to always know defeat. He will always reach for victory, but he'll always fall short of it. After all, if we think back to the cross, Satan was in his own thinking, majestic and triumphant over Jesus at the cross, but he failed. He bruised Jesus' heel at the cross, but it made possible for his own head to be crushed. And might I share this as well, that in Jesus we share this victory over Satan. I like what it says in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. It says, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet quickly. That's beautiful. Now, for God to see the defeat of Satan at the very first flush of seeming victory on Satan's behalf shows that God knew what he was doing all along. Right? When God saw Adam and Eve sin in the garden, what did God do in heaven? Oh no! Now my whole plan is blown! What am I going to do now? No, 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 God laid it down right because he had an eternal plan of the ages, right? And he laid down right away. And he said, listen, this didn't set back my plan at all because my plan is to bring forth something greater than man in Eden's innocence. My plan is to bring forth redeemed man. Ladies and gentlemen, if you take anything from tonight's study, please take this because I think it's absolutely essential to understanding God's plan of the ages. Many people have the misconception that God's ultimate plan... I was reading a, a wonderful devotional writer, a wonderful Christian man, but he was speaking, just the other day I was reading him, and he was speaking as if God's great plan is to bring us back to the innocence of Eden. That that's his whole plan. No, no. God's great plan is to take us beyond the innocence of Eden. Redeemed man is greater than innocent man. I'll say this. I hope I say it a hundred times through this series. Are you ready for this? We gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. And this is the great reason why God has allowed evil and suffering because without it there is no redemption. There is no redeemed man unless there's something to redeem us from. We often think that, that the ideal is Adam in Eden's innocence. But God wants something greater. He wants positive righteousness in people. Innocence is like a zero. There's nothing bad, but it also means there's nothing good. God wants us to be more than a blank zero. He wants us to be the righteousness of God. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and you'll see exactly what I'm speaking of, because 2 Corinthians 5, 21 explains it very powerfully. It says this, For he, that is God the Father, made him, that is God the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Not that we would become the innocence of Adam in him, but that we would become the righteousness of God in him. Can I tell you right now, the righteousness of God is greater than the innocence of Adam. And that's what God wants to put into you as a redeemed man or a redeemed woman. It's an amazing expression. Let me read you this wonderful quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says this about this phrase, the righteousness of God. What a grand expression. He makes us righteous through the righteousness of Jesus. Nay, not only makes us righteous, but righteousness. Nay, that is not all, but he makes us the righteousness of God that is higher than the righteousness of Adam in the garden. It is more divinely perfect than angelic perfection. That is what we gain in Jesus Christ we gain something greater in Jesus than we ever possessed in Adam. We never read once of Adam being called the righteousness of God, or even a child of God, or other glorious titles that believers are given. We think wrongly when we think of redemption as merely a restoration of what was lost with Adam. No, no, no. We are granted more in Jesus than Adam ever so friends, that's why God has allowed evil. Because as a result of it, he will bring out of it all a world that is greater. A world that has a greater result than a world that had never known evil. Let me put it to you this way. As we look at the world around us, we must say that we do not live in the best possible world. Why is that a hard philosophical thing to agree to? We do not live in the best possible world. One less murder, one less robbery, one less sick child, one less ticket on the freeway. All these things you could say, it would be a better world. We do not live in the best possible world. So if God is all powerful, why has he not made this the best possible world? The answer lies in understanding what the best possible world is. It's not the world of innocence, but the world of redemption. The best possible world is not the world that has never experienced sin and evil, but the world that has been redeemed and rescued from sin and evil. And we have to see that God's work of redemption is greater than the work of creation. For God to have the allegiance and love of creatures who are to be more than robots, sin and rebellion have to be allowed. And if God is going to allow sin and rebellion, he has to allow it. He just can't allow it when we want it and stop it when we want him to stop it. No, my friends, this is not the best possible world. But it is the best way to the best possible world. The best possible world is yet to come as God is going to bring it out when humanity is finally glorified and history is over, which we're going to get to before we're finished with this series. The best possible world is the world when all things are resolved in Jesus Christ, when they are summed up in Him according to the eternal mystery of His world described in Ephesians 1.10, and modeled in Ephesians chapter 3. This is the world where true righteousness is rewarded and true evil is properly judged. The resolution of all things is in Jesus. Now, I imagine that some of you might be sitting here and you may disagree with God's plan for the ages. You may say, honestly, I disagree. Uh, I don't think I would do it that way. I would just do it with the world of innocence, and I think that that would be the best possible world. Let me respond to you in two ways. And I say this with all the kindness in my heart. Who cares what you think about that? <laughs> right? Who, who, who put you in charge? Are, are you now promoted to God? 
I mean, really, you could say, well, I think the world should be this, or I think the world should be that. Listen, it's God's world. He, he can desire and de determine what will be the best. But second, consider this. Even though God planned it so that a world that allows sin and suffering is the best possible way to the best possible world, God did not distance himself from the pain and suffering. He added humanity to his deity so that he would walk among us. And the only thing that made him do it was his love. He experienced the pain and the suffering of this life. And he took upon himself the guilt and the penalty of our sin. There sits in heaven our glorified enthroned Lord who can say, I know what you're going through. And that should be a comfort to us all. So please understand. Even though God has all the authority in the world to set the ground rules and say this is the best possible world and this is how I'm going to get there and what you or I or any of us think it really doesn't matter because God has the authority to do it. Yes, God said, I will share in their pain. I will experience their suffering. There is nobody in this world who needs to walk alone and isolated in their pain and their suffering because the Son of God added humanity to His deity and walked among us experienced what we experience in these things. He did not detach himself from it. Now, in five minutes, I'm going to summarize for you the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. <laughs> it's not all that difficult. Let's say you're Adam and Eve, and you do a really bad thing. What's the really bad thing? Well, you disobey God and you eat the forbidden fruit, right? Really bad thing. But if Adam and Eve were like you or I, I, I think I know how I would respond to this. I'd say, man, I can do better, right? God, I'm really sorry. I'm not going to do stuff like that again. No, I'm going to do it different. You know, I'm, come on, let's get better. Right? Let, let, let's improve, right? What do the chapters in Genesis after the fall show us? Does it show us self-improvement on behalf of mankind? <laughs> no, no, no. It shows it going from bad to worse to worser. I know it's not a word, but you know exactly what I mean, right? I mean, in Genesis 3, you have the deception of Eve. In Genesis 3, you have the outright rebellion of Adam. In Genesis 3, you have man's first attempt to cover his sin, his first lie to God. Those were terrible sins on top of sin, was it not? And then in Genesis 3, you have man's first denial of guilt before God, all the excuses Adam made. By the way, he tried to push it off onto his wife, right? Way to go, Adam. Oh, it's just terrible sin after sin after sin. It really wasn't like, oh, I did that one bad thing, but now I'll be good. Even in Adam and Eve, we see the cascading effects of sin. But after them, it gets worse. What happens with Adam and Eve? They give birth to two sons, right? And one of them, the son that they thought would be a savior. Because by the way, who did God say would be the one to be the savior? The rescuer, the one who would crush Satan's head, it would be the seed of the woman. Can you imagine when Eve first had a baby? I mean, the first one. She didn't have any parenting books or anything like that. First one. They named him Cain, which means I have him. Basically, you're saying, this is the one. And Cain grew up to be a savior? No, what? A murderer. Talk about going from bad to worse. And he rejected God's stop signs. He rejected God's guidance. He became the first murderer. And then later on, Genesis chapter 4, you have man's first glorying and sin and pride, right? Where, where he says, listen, anybody who avenges me, Lamech says, I'll avenge them sevenfold. And then you have in Genesis chapter 6, man's embrace of the demonic and the occult in a common rebellion against God. And then you have, it's so bad on planet earth that what does God have to do? He has to wipe out the earth with a catastrophic flood that leaves only a family of eight remaining, Noah and his children. Wipes out, listen, that's how bad it was on earth. But, but listen, God gave him a new start, right? 
We'll start anew. We'll get it right this time. Come on, guys. It's our new start. It's the, it's the after the flood. All of humanity is just down to eight people. We can do it right this time. How long did that last? You have the shameful incident, right, with Noah and his sons right out of the ark. And then you have what I think is the summit peak of man's arrogance and rebellion against God in those first 11 chapters. You have the Tower of Babel. Very interesting. The Bible says, first of all, that God told mankind, I'll never flood the world again. I'll never flood the world again, and I'll give you my bow in the clouds to, to prove it. And then you know what they did at Babel? Not only did they ignore God's command to spread out over the earth, they said, no, thank you, God, we're going to stay right here. But they built a tower, and the Bible says that they used pitch for mortar. Do you know what pitch is? It's tar, asphalt. Do you know what function it would serve in the ancient world? Waterproofing. They built a waterproof tower. I think it was a great big declaration to God. God, you can give us all the rainbows you want. We don't believe you. We're right here at Babel, and we're not going anywhere. From bad to worse to worser. That's the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, you could divide the Bible very neatly between Genesis chapter... 1 through 11, and then Genesis chapter 12, all the way to Revelation 22. Really? Because Genesis chapters 1 through 11 presents to us the creation of the world and the fall. Not only what Adam and Eve did in the garden, but bad to worse to worser. And starting with Genesis chapter 12, God says, I'm going to roll out more of my plan of the ages, and I'm going to show you how my plan is going to put into effect. And you know what he does? He says, I'm going to find a man. I'm going to work through a man. And next week we're going to talk about that man and how God worked out his great plan of the ages through him. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? Abraham. We're going to talk about the Abrahamic covenant next week. It's thrilling stuff. My friends, don't forget. I, I, I don't want to speak flippantly here tonight. Listen, I, I said, you know, who cares if you disagree with God's plan? And in a sense, we can laugh about that because it is laughable to think that we could disagree with God, right? Who are we? But I think of anybody, they're here, they're listening to this later. They're going through the ringer. Their life is filled with pain and questioning and doubts and fears. And you wonder where God is. I'll tell you where God is. God is close to you in your pain if you'll reach out to him. In his plan, he'll use pain and suffering. He'll work through it all to establish a greater work of redemption and restoration. He'll do it in the great big picture, and he'll do it in the individual picture that's your life. But it happens the same way. He did it through the identification of pain and suffering that you see symbolized by the bread and the, the, the wine over here on each particular side. The bread and the cup that speaks to us of the death of Jesus on our behalf, does it not? He identified with our pain, with our sin, with our struggle. Don't ever forget that. God is close to you in the midst of it. Ted and the team are going to come on up here as I pray. And we're going to have a lot of time of worship here. And this is how we're going to do it. For the first song, if you'd like to, you can come on up for partake of communion and that. The last couple songs, we're going to have the prayer team come up. And you're still welcome to come up and participate in communion. But the prayer team will be up here too. Because I, I think that maybe there's some people here tonight. You, you see something with different eyes tonight. And you need to pray about it with somebody. Father, that is our prayer right here, right now. We love you, God. And we think about your great eternal plan. And we ask that you would give us greater wisdom, greater trust, greater sensitivity to you and your plan. We love you, Lord. We want to trust you and we want to trust your plan. Thank you, Jesus, for not remaining distant from us, but for coming near to us. Thank you for the cross. Amen.